If a random person came up to you in the street and tried to give you financial advice, you wouldn't listen to them, right? So then why would you listen to the financial advice of someone on the internet? Being a social media influencer gives you absolutely zero authority on the subject matter. Uh, just because you're on camera doesn't make you any smarter or better. If anything, it's just an indication that the person you're watching most likely has an overinflated ego. I'm working on it. When the Andor series ended, I wanted to make a video comparing Andor to The Mandalorian. It was very clear to me at the time that these two shows were probably the best things that Disney has produced since they bought the Star Wars IP. And at the time, I really wanted to do a video comparing these two shows and kind of like answering this question, which one was better? But there were a few factors that made me hesitate uh, because of the pandemic. I guess there was a huge delay in between the second season of Mandalorian and the third season of the Mandalorian. And so I wanted people to have a more fresh viewing of The Mandalorian before you know I made this video. And at the same time, it seemed like a lot of people hadn't seen Andor at all because of a variety of different reasons. It wasn't well advertised. It came out at the same time that Game of Thrones and the new Lord of the Rings uh, series came out. So it was just kind of stuck in a bad place scheduling wise. And in general, fans were kind of pissed off about how mediocre book of Boba Fett and Kenobi felt. And I guess, you know, other people had Star Wars fatigue. Some just didn't want to pay for Disney Plus. I completely get that. And then you have that, you know, group of people who are all about identity politics and they must look at their own tribe or group to determine what type of content they should, you know, watch, which I think is utterly stupid. And unfortunately for them, Andor is a perfect example of why it's dumb to let your community decide what is okay or what is not okay to consume. Because if they had found out themselves and watched Andor, well, they would have found a show that bucked almost every Disney trend in a very positive and meaningful way. Anyway, so at the end of the Andor first season, I did a poll asking people which Star Wars show is their favorite, and these are the results. Let me remind you that most of the people who watch my channel are uh, big Star Wars fans, right? And at the time of this poll, the most active fans, the ones who answered this poll, most likely have been watching my very passionate 20 minute character breakdowns of Andor. I clearly loved the shows and the people who showed up for these polls were very much slanted towards liking Andor. And still The Mandalorian clearly outperformed Andor. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty disappointed by this, but from a purely intellectual point of view, I understand exactly why The Mandalorian was seen as a better show. And I agree with a few of those arguments actually. I definitely agree that The Mandalorian seems to really capture the original spirit of the Star Wars films. It was also around this time that the fans really started clashing over Andor. You had the pro-Andor camp and the anti-Andor camp, and I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that some larger Star Wars influencers um, started putting their opinions out and hot takes, and I think that kind of just pissed off people on both sides. So yeah, things got nasty. The pro-Andor crowd basically saw the anti-Andor crowd as a bunch of uncultured people who just want lasers, explosions, X-wings, and you know, whatever. And the anti-Andor crowd was calling the pro-Andor crowd elitist, and um, you know, rightly so in some ways. And they were also saying that, you know, Andor had nothing to do with Star Wars because it lacked a lot of those core central elements like aliens, uh, the Force, these kind of things. For them, Andor might be a good show, but it just didn't feel like Star Wars for them. And there was also another group that just believed that Andor was a bit too boring because there's too much dialogue and build up. A lot of these people also seem to really enjoy every third episode, which is the climax of each, you know, story arc, but whatever. The point is, at the time, the environment was not right for a Mandalorian versus Andor video. That would have just pissed off more people. I felt like it'd be a better idea to wait a little bit, let more people see both shows, let people calm down, let the passions, emotions run their course, so that uh, we can have a good discussion about this. And so I did a poll recently about which show people liked the most, and the numbers changed quite a bit, with Andor becoming a lot more popular than before, and The Mandalorian dropping a little bit. Now, obviously, the third season of The Mandalorian was not well received by many of the fans for a variety of reasons, which might be why The Mandalorian has dropped a bit. But at the same time, I think a lot more people caught up and actually watched Andor during the holidays, which is great. But for the most part, the fans liked The Mandalorian the most, and the fans have spoken, and a discussion, right? Of course not. I have my opinions, I have my biases, and they say that Andor is better. I have spoken. Objectively, I actually think there are a lot of things mechanically that Tony Gilroy does that we just haven't seen from other directors in the Star Wars franchise. He's just functioning at a different level. George Lucas was an amazing world builder. He had a very strong cinematic sense, but he was really terrible with casting actors and directing actors in dialogue. 
This has always been a major weakness for Star Wars, but when George Lucas auteured the prequel series, we really saw this weakness come out to the forefront, and it got pretty ugly. This is why a lot of critics call Star Wars a soap opera in a pretty derogative way. The acting is over the top, the lines are over the top, and it can get cringy. I'm in agony. The closer I get to you, the worse it gets. The thought of not being with you, I can't breathe. I think Hayden Christensen gets a lot of hate for these scenes, but we gotta remember, like, these lines to start out with were just, a whole, holy sh**, they're bad. Like, it's so cringy. I mean, Natalie Portman doesn't fare that much better in these scenes, and she won the Academy Award for Best Actress. So I took some film critiquing classes when I was in school, and I think my professor at the time, she would have she would have seen these scenes in the prequels, and she would have laughed at them. She would have labeled them as completely terrible. She would have rejected the entire film. And that's because she was kind of like, she wasn't very smart. She was closed-minded and she was very elitist. I mean, you, you just can't teach critiquing by creating an orthodoxy, right? And so despite how terrible some elements in the prequels were, it's still by far my favorite trilogy in the series. And I think that says a lot about how talented George Lucas is at world building VFX and cinematography. He's definitely talented enough for me to overlook all of the terrible lines and even grow to love them, if I'm being honest. I can't breathe. This shows us that you can completely fail in certain aspects of filmmaking um, and then succeed so well in other aspects of filmmaking that uh, the overall product is just awesome. Now, Tony Gilroy likes drama as well, but I think he has a much more modern take on larger-than-life characters. When Luther Rael and Kino Loy deliver their speeches, we see the buildup of emotion through all of the episodes. We see why they can no longer be silent and why they need to speak. These are moments of amazing cinema because they're full of truth and pain in the audience. They're not just expecting these speeches, they deeply, deeply want these speeches to happen. That when they say we are being released, we are being transferred to some other prison to go and die. And that ends today. There is one way out. I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. Tony Gilroy is a master at manipulating the audience and giving them exactly what they want. And uh, these two speeches, let me remind you, were in the same freaking episode. One of the best episodes of any Star Wars content, I think. Scenes like this has confirmed what I always believed was possible with Star Wars. I've always loved Star Wars for the world and the lore and everything else. And I've seen, you know, since the EU days to Disney, so many you know, greasy palmed individuals get their grubby hands on Star Wars and just misuse it by creating shitty content. Finally, in Andor, I was seeing world-class acting, dialogue, story. I was watching a director and writing team that consciously focused on the themes of revolution and hammered away at those themes until the audience themselves could not help but feel affected and a part of something greater. It was masterful. I mean, Tony Gilroy's biggest weakness, if he had any weaknesses, was the fact that he had never done a sci-fi fantasy genre of film. And so he wasn't really like used to those elements of world building. But the thing is it didn't matter because so many other artists and writers had already built a playground for him to play with, with all sorts of rules and restrictions so that he didn't stray too far away from that Star Wars feel. And despite all this, Tony Gilroy still didn't include any major alien characters, probably because he thought they looked too silly which I think is great. If you guys watch my show, you know that I love taking themes and elements of Star Wars and relating it to real life things. And that's because I don't want Star Wars just to be escapism for people. I want it to make their own lives richer. I want to use Star Wars to get them interested in things that they might otherwise not get interested in. And so you know it was inevitable for me to love this show and or, which does exactly that. It really does try to connect with the audience in a realistic way. And Tony Gilroy, he's, you know, he's a student of humanity and history. He studies how people move and act. He's interested in the truth, whatever it is, rather than pushing some type of agenda like rebellion good, empire bad. The Rebels in Rogue One, which he helped finish in Andor, are not perfect. Most of them are unstable, devious, cold, and generally not great people. Many of them are murderers and terrorists. And this is the true phase of rebellion. This is how most early rebellions start with people on the fringe who are so moved by oppression that they are suffering that they're willing to risk it all. Juxtapose that with the Rebels we see in New Hope, and it's a completely different picture, almost a different universe. 
And I understand why a lot of people didn't like Andor for this reason. They just thought it was a little too different. The themes were a little too serious and dark for Star Wars. But in all honesty, for me and a lot of fans out there who liked Andor, this is how we've always seen Star Wars. We've always read in between the lines and thought, oh, wow, this is a really the place. So let's move on to The Mandalorian. I think it's a terrific show. When the first season came out, it was super focused. Everything was very tight. The cinematography, the acting, the story. It almost had the simplicity we see in the early animated Clone Wars episodes. And I think the scale was small and limited because of how they shot it with those, you know, live screens and everything. But at the core of this show is a very special and strong relationship. The one that was built between Gogurt and Din Djarin. And I think this is why the show does so well. The simplicity of these earlier scenes seasons of The Mandalorian made it just great for mass appeal. Everyone could find something in The Mandalorian that they liked. And I was being approached by, you know, people in my family that I never thought would watch a Star Wars show, but they were watching The Mandalorian. So very successful. Also, Baby Yoda was a brilliant idea. As much as I want to hate the little guy for being what essentially is a cheap marketing trick, but I can't because he's so goddamn adorable and devious. It's actually exactly the type of move that George Lucas would have made in his prime. Uh, you know, introduce some very cute and lovable character for audiences to love and buy merchandise with. Although in his case, both the Ewoks and Jar Jar Binks were initially hated until they started looking more delicious. I have to stop filming these when I'm hungry. But anyway, The Mandalorian was a great success and I think that has a lot to do with the team behind it. Dave Filoni is really the lore master. He understands the spirit of Star Wars and what the stories and characters mean for the fans. And John Favreau, well, he's a master at making content for us basement dwelling video game playing nerds. He just gets us. He knows that like deep down, you know, behind this mask we all put up, we want to be accepted by society. We want to help people. We want to bring uh, good things to the world. We want to protect the weak and innocent. Dave Filoni and John Favreau always understood the community better than any other Star Wars creator. And I think they also saw a lot of goodness in the community and they wanted that to come to the forefront. You just have to look in between all the fucked up sense of humor, the weird memes, the shipping of random characters, the erotic fan stories. Okay, maybe we need to be base Delta Zeroed. Din Djarin purposely has a helmet on. He's purposely vague in his dialogue and actions. And when he does act, there's no controversy. He always does the right thing. In essence, he is the perfect vehicle for a show like this. Cool enough to be everyone's favorite, but not too eccentric or unique so that it would offend people and you know drive mass appeal away from him. Instead, what Filoni and Favreau do is they surround Din Djarin with weirder and sillier characters so that they can still have those moments they need without sacrificing the main character. So my main criticism at The Mandalorian is that I felt like the first season was a little bit too simple um, and there wasn't like this larger goal or motivation behind Din Djarin's actions. I just felt like the show was a little bit aimless and like serialized. Now, of course, this is more like personal preference than it is like an objective truth. But then the second season and third season put all of my concerns to rest. The Mandalorian basically expanded its world, included new characters and factions until we finally see what the Mandalorian's real purpose is in season three, which is the unification of Mandalore. Up until this point, that was my biggest gripe. Like, what is the Mandalorian doing? Like, where is this all going? What is the point of all this? But season three turned out to be a pretty epic and sloppy story of various Mandalorian factions coming together, dropping their differences and joining forces. Now, there were a lot of cringy lines. There were some, you know, some of your typical terrible Disney choreography and action sequences. But other than that, I think this third season really worked well. The central message in the season was really relevant. I even have a theory that the story is supposed to mirror the tension we have in society and more specifically the fandom. I mean, the third season of The Mandalorian was really about how stupid and terrible the culture wars are. It was a message about unity, putting aside your differences and focusing more on our similarities and mutual needs and wants. And also letting go of your own insecurities and ego and accepting that there are going to be people different from you that live in this world or galaxy and that's not going to harm or change your life or invalidate anything you think. As someone who is obviously deeply concerned about, you know, the culture wars and which direction our society is going and what they're focusing on, uh, seeing Disney come up with this type of message was kind of shocking for me, but I really enjoyed it. 
And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that it was Jon Favreau and Floney who were in charge of delivering this type of message. It could have gotten really bad if they put the wrong person in charge of this project. I mean, at the core of this show are the Children on the Watch, a deeply conservative and cult-like organization that is a thinly veiled representation of some of the fans who have been very critical about Star Wars. Instead of making these guys, the Children on the Watch just like uncontrollable evil bad guys, they did exactly the opposite. They humanized these people. By subverting expectations, by humanizing the children on watch and showing us that they're actually really good people, it teaches the audience that we should always challenge prejudice and group opinions on other groups. I feel like we really need more of this in our art, in our stories, in our social media. God knows that the algorithm is trying to shove as much negative stuff in our face because, you know, that's kind of how our brains are designed to, to, to work in the first place. But if there is one thing I truly believe in ideology that I have, it is that most people are good or want the opportunity to be good. And that most of the terrible things you see in the world are a result of miscommunication and incompetence rather than evil intent. This is how humans have always been, really. And Disney, which has basically monopolized our entire childhood, should be doing something positive with Star Wars. It is an important franchise. It has a huge amount of reach. And more importantly, the next generation are watching this, and we want to give them positive messages. They are our future. Star Wars shouldn't be divisive. It shouldn't be fanning the fuels of the culture war. It should be trying to solve the problems we face as a society. Especially now that the worst people in our society, the extreme left and the extreme right, have taken over the narrative and basically control everything we talk about. I mean, when are all of you people at home, all of you good nature folks out there, all of you moderates and centrists, when will you be radical and Put your foot down and say enough is enough. I do not care what sex or gender or politics my characters have in my films. I just want the content to be good, you f**ks. Now, what I want to leave you guys off with is just like my general understanding of reviews. Like, I love Andor. I really love Andor. I think it is the best thing that's happened in Star Wars, okay? But remember this, guys. Reviews, especially from one single person and not from an aggregator, they don't really mean a lot. Um, there's no objective truth when it comes to looking at art, looking at films and TV, and anyone who says otherwise are full of shit. I understand why The Mandalorian is far more popular than Andor. The first two episodes of Andor are going to be slow for people who don't watch Tony Gilroy-style slow burns. It's just another type of filmmaking for a completely different audience, and that is how our world works. We can't all like the same things, and that's perfectly fine. And even though I think Andor has better writing, acting, and directing than The Mandalorian, that's just kind of me being elitist and putting more of an importance on basic mechanics of filmmaking. At the end of the day, what really matters is the end product and how a piece of art affects you. If lightsabers are your thing because they're beautiful and cool, if you like explosions or just silly aliens, then you should pursue the things you like. If you like a specific character that everyone hates, but you just like them because they got you through a very hard time in your life, then stick with it, stick with your gut, trust yourself, especially on issues like this. I mean, don't trust yourself when it comes to like medical knowledge or rocket science, you know, go towards the experts in these things. But this is, this is opinion, whether you like a piece of art or not, it has always been something based on personal bias and preference. And anyone who gets triggered or upset by your point of view, remember this, that is their insecurity, okay? That is not about you. That is about them wanting to control everyone and making everyone around them the same as them. Those kind of people, they got a lot of growing up to do, okay? So I wanna leave you guys off with this quote from Roger Ebert, the late Roger Ebert. He, he's basically the only critic I ever respected and, and watched because I just, I like his, his understanding of his own profession. Criticism is a destructive activity. If I like something and the critics didn't, they can't see what's right there before their eyes because they're in love with some theory. They don't have feelings, they have systems. They think they know better than creators. They praise what they would have done instead of what an artist has done. They use foreign words to show off. They're terrified of being exposed as the empty posers they are. They are leeches on the skin of art. So guys, fuck critics. Go enjoy Star Wars. Star Wars. Wise.